Hi everybody, this is James Chai, Arfar Bark Bark Rescue Foundation and registered nonprofit based out of Vancouver, Canada, and I am doing my episode. I haven't uh, did it last week. I did it a couple times last week, and I said I was just going to go down to Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Uh, today is October 28th, episode number 19. I'm sorry, episode number 29. And um, so I'm just going to, like I say, is this, I'm going to keep it a little bit shorter and try to be a bit more on point on things. And if you take a look at the stuff that I posted, you'll see that I have a bit more detail on it. And James Chai, let's our see if I can get this going so I'm gonna to try to pull up what I'm talking about so that way I can see live comments as they happen and uh, I have a bit more detail on it and James try uh, our okay trying, get to, this going, trying so. to get the volume down here I'm sorry everyone okay so um, what I'm gonna talk about today is what I look for when recommending or if you are uh, hiring a trainer and and these things are pretty important um, because we want to know is a trainer right for us and when it comes to my work um, so everything I'm going to talk about is going to be specific to the to, to what I look for in a trainer right so um, some people may feel okay I, I'm talking about things that are not um, what you're looking for uh, but when it comes to me on my end it, it, it again comes down to what I'm looking for in a um, uh, in a dog trainer um, if they're gonna work with my dog or if I'm gonna oh, they're not going to because I do it myself but if they're going to, um, if your trainer that you're kind of hiring is going to um, work with your dog's dysfunctions, what do you look for? Uh, last couple of days has been pretty crappy for me, uh, and, and crappy in the sense that I, I'm getting people who contact me um, after uh, after they've gone right to the end of their their tolerance, and they're basically saying, "I'm going to be killing my dog." And a lot of times this comes from either, it doesn't usually come from the owner themselves, right? It doesn't come from the dog owner. It doesn't come from the human, the parent of the dog. It usually comes from their spouse, their partner, boyfriend, girlfriend, uh, from the vet, from other people in the neighborhood. All these people who are contributing to the death of your dog are these people who are causing this. It's unbelievable that someone would go up to you and say, you know, your dog's a problem. You should kill your dog. But this is literally what is happening to people Unbelievably, would you, would, I mean, would you, like, what kind of person just goes up and says, your dog is a, is a, is a tough dog, it's a horrible dog, and you should kill your dog. Uh, we have the vets that are doing the same thing as well. I mean, every single person that contacted me in this last week since I've been off, uh, um, they've all said that they talked to the vet, and the vet says there's no hope for my dog, or my dog needs to be on medication, or my dog needs to be put down killed and it just blows my mind that that happened I actually had somebody contacted me um, you know a few months ago and then disappeared and then a, a couple of months after that contacted me and then disappeared again and then sends me a message a plea like I don't know what to do with my dog the, uh, my dog did this and this is someone in my family and now my family uh, my partner's telling me I have to it's either the dog or or, or him and I'm like wow Okay, so now you're gonna just choose and and this person says to me uh, in their message is that I'm gonna talk to my vet about putting my dog down and It's like the <laughs> Lincoln stop it's like the audacity of people to say yeah, I'm just gonna kill my dog and, and I say to these people surrender your dog Find a rescue that'll take your dog, spend the money to rehabilitate your dog, to train or down train your dog, because these are the responsibilities that you cause as the owner. If you're just adopting a dog that's a rescue and so forth like that, and in just first few months, five, six months, you know, your dog's fine and there's no issues and then it starts developing issues, it's not your dog's fault. If you adopt a dog and then your dog eventually starts get Lincoln, Lincoln, okay, stop please sorry it's just really loud i think um and then lincoln here's lincoln hi lincoln lincoln hello lincoln Ooh, yuck. Ah, he's all slobbery um but but you know take responsibility for the behavior of your dog when you see something happening in the smallest little nuances the things that you find a bit concerning do something about it there's anthony i didn't gate everyone away so um um, take responsibility 
and don't put yourself in a in such a uh, pedestal. And I'm saying this to the people. I, I can. I'm sure I'm alienating a bunch of people who are going to end up watching this and go, you know, ah, he's my dog. I can do whatever I want with my dog. I can kill my dog if I want to. Well, yeah, you can. It's absolutely. You're right. Under the eyes of the law, your dog is viewed as property, right? Your dog's property. Someone killed your dog. What happens? Oh well, you know, you owe me for your dog. How much it costs? That's it. There's no jail. I mean, it's, it's cruelty. But you, there's nothing. You, there's a recent article by a dog walker on the North Shore in Vancouver, British Columbia, who was beating his own dogs, neglecting his own dogs. Uh, there's a vet that's with a Richmond out there at, at a well-known hospital, a vet hospital in Richmond, who's like, oh, it's normal behavior for someone to beat their dog. And the guy's a trainer too, a progressive dog. So I'll get to that part as well. Um, so there you are. Hi, Christina. Um, so, so it's just really a matter of understanding that you're responsible for the behavior of your dog if your dog shows up with no issues or if you buy your dog, etc. cetera. You get your dog as a puppy two months, three months of age, right? Two months, eight weeks, three months, 12 weeks. Pretty hard to say that your dog is like that because your dog is a, a matter of your environment, how you bring up your dog, how you raise your child, how you raise your dog, same thing. There, if you let your child go running around and start punching people in the face, your child's going to become a bit of a criminal when they get older. So what do you do? You take care of your child. Stop doing that. I'm taking responsibility. My child is starting to be misbehaving and it's going to might be an issue at preschool or elementary. Okay, I'm going to talk to my child and tell them not to do it. Taking responsibility. People aren't doing that with their dogs when they're, they're going right off the bat saying, you know, I'm just going to kill my dog. People aren't. People aren't taking responsibility when they're supposed to take responsibility. They're just callously saying, yeah, whatever. You know, like I said, uh, a couple weeks back, I had a, a physician who refused to surrender their dog. Even though very clear, very clear that the individual and the family environment was contributory to their dog's behavior. And I said, surrender your dog. I can't do that. Well, I'm, I can tell you my professional opinion that your dog will probably improve progress and have a better life in a different family with less activity, like children also, right? Less activity in the home and they'll have, I can, I'm not gonna do that. My dog's already bit somebody and I, you know, a couple of times I'm not gonna take responsibility, blah, blah, blah. Y yeah, take freaking responsibility and have your dog surrendered before your dog becomes an issue. Take responsibility. Find a trainer. All these things, and I, I it's just stop behaving as if you own life. And, and I'm being really point blank to this because it is super depressing. Like the world I live in, 70% of the people who contact me are already saying openly, I've been told to kill my dog, or I'm thinking of killing my dog. It's just not cool, people. Just not cool. And the people who are out there and you go to the Facebook groups and all this stuff, kill the dog, your dog's horrible, blah, blah, blah. All these people are contributing to it. It doesn't matter what you think. The reality is you're contributing. You're part of the bullying crowd that are telling the, this one despondent owner, I don't know what to do. What should I do? I need help. That's why they're posting publicly with their name on Facebook or on Instagram or Twitter. I need help. Don't go and throw gasoline on a fire that's already burning them already. Don't go and say, go kill your dog. Better than that, just say, you know what? I really admire that you're at least reaching out publicly to say this, and I commend you. I hope you find the help that you can for your dog, and that's it. Because when you post, when anyone, when, when you post and say, kill your dog, there's no hope, etc., you're contributing to it. You're contributing to the death. You're contributing to the owner by convincing the owner through peer pressure and bullying to kill their dog. For someone to post publicly that they have a problem with their dog is not an easy thing to do. It's an emotional cry for help. I need help with my dog that is stressing me out, stressing my family out, has been reactive. I don't want my dog to attack people. So I'm gonna post this and say, what, a last ditch effort to the public, please help me. I don't want to be graphic in the sense of it, but it's similar to somebody saying, I need help, and they're going through depression, and they don't get the help, then they do something horrific. 
you would never see anyone go, yeah, you know, if someone posts something that says, I'm going to kill myself, you're never going to see someone go, you should do it. Oh, yeah, your life sucks. What do people say? They actually have some humanity. These people actually have humanity. No, don't kill your, there's different things you can do. You can text this number, right? There's a 24 seven number. I'll, I'll find it and I'll post it in here if anyone needs that. But you can text this if someone will help you. There's, there's mental health services all over the place. And then yet these are the same people who will then go and say to somebody, go kill your dog. Your dog can't be fixed. Your dog is gonna be like that. It's a life. Really, your dog is, they have, they have feelings, they have emotions. And people say, oh, well, you know, my dog is, uh, the life before, you know, I mean, my, my dog is not happy, you know. And they're told this by vets and by behaviors and by trainers and all stuff. And then, like I said, I'm not making any friends with the professionals who are out there who, who go after me. But they say, oh, you know, your dog's not having good life. Your dog's not having fun. Your dog's quality of life is poor. Those people can go F themselves. They call that behavioral euthanasia. It's one of the most disgusting scapegoat comments that you can make. Erica Eden from Eden's Dog Training Academy, she uses it, she thinks it's normal. Like, if you go to that kind of statement, you should be the heck out of the business. You have no idea, you're using a scapegoat term for behavioral euthanasia. Behavior so bad that the dog has to be killed because the dog is suffering and that does that not like euthanasia is to put someone out of a human pain and suffering chronic enduring no end in sight euthanasia it's been it's been euphemistically transferred into the animal shelters 15 dogs were euthanized today no they weren't euthanized they were killed and then these freaking These freaking trainers and behaviorists are out there coming up with what term can we make up today so we can kill someone's dog and not feel bad about it. Behavioral euthanasia has got to be the most wimpiest, scapegoat, ego-driven comment I've ever heard for an ineptitude, inexperience, and lack of skill when it comes to working with a dog. And people say, oh, well, you know, there's no way to help this dog. So that's why they had to be killed. You know, if you think about it, the way that dog lived, present in your home, not having any issues, hanging out there, living by themselves, eating food, maybe come up to you for a few pets and going back off on their own. The life of that dog that you're thinking of killing is way better than them being in the shelter. It's way better than them being on the street fighting to survive waiting for another dog to attack them or another predator in the in the in, in the wild to attack them coyote whatever way better life where there are with you right then and there but it's a frustration and it's the emotional disenfranchisement the humans have when we start walking away from our moral responsibility and maybe that's a description of our universe that we live in now how we behave as a society, but it sucks. And it sucks when people look at their dog from the point of, I absolutely love the dog, blah, 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 to a few months later, yeah, I'm gonna kill my dog. And I know people say, oh, well, you know, this is what we're told. Well, exactly, it's what you're told. It's not your fault. For those of you, not the, the, the trolls that go and tell people to kill their dog, but for the, those of you who are struggling with the dog that you have, that have behavioral issues, et cetera, and et cetera, right? All that stuff. You're the ones that are the hero to your dog. Your dog may not realize how close they are to death, but that's where it is. And then you have to put up with people telling you to kill your dog. Worse is when you get the vets and the behaviors and the trainers telling you to kill your dog. Dr. Rebecca Ledger freely writes that into her thing. Either the dog gets rehomed or the dog is killed. Literally, that's what she wrote in her evaluation report. It's an epidemic of apathy, antipathy, and lack of skill, protecting one's ego. It's just incredibly frustrating. All these preventable deaths, I, that's all I deal with. 
like 70% of the people that contact me are already talking about killing their dog. And then they cite other trainers and behaviors and vets. Vet said this, so da, 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 there's no hope, no quality of life. You know, it's like, for one thing, and, and here's the thing, vets don't recommend me because I'm not part of their science background, which is ridiculous because I'm talking about psychology on a root level that's, that's, that's rooted in psychogenetic behavior that is no different than human psychosis. But the industry hasn't gotten to that point because the industry is still on the tricycle with the two wheels relying on Pavlov and treat training and giving food to dysfunctional dogs when nowhere in the entire canine species does food exist as a communication device. More than anything else, food is used to attack other dogs with because it's a, it's a resource. It's a survival resource. And then you have these people who are just telling you, like vets don't know. They get the white paper. They get the little, uh, you know, uh, uh, professional documents that come through and they're through their college, right? The white paper and the paper says this and this and can't help a dog. Uh, if dog doesn't take food, you should kill the dog. Medicate the dog first, blah, 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 blah. You got the trainers and behaviors. Uh, sorry, you got the trainers and, um, well, behaviors too, who are saying, well, you know, we've learned this. And we're talking about operant conditioning and everything. Oh, my gosh. What are you, like 12? You're talking about operant conditioning? Google B.F. Skinner. B as in Bob, S as in Frank, Skinner as in Skinner, S-K-I-N-N-E-R, operant conditioning. And just go, just, just Google debunking B.F. Skinner or B.F. Skinner debunked or Skinner debunked. And you're going to see people saying the guy was a fool. He may have brought some inroads into the psychiatry aspects, of, but he, he was a fool. He thought that he could train a person to do things with the right amount of motivation, reward, motivation. He could train a person to do anything, which is what operant conditioning, which is exactly what treat training is trying to do with dogs. And again, it goes back to Pavlov. And Ivan Pavlov is where it's all set there in 1897 when he published his theory 122 years ago when people own slaves. So every time you get somebody who's treat training your dysfunctional dog, I'm not talking about obedience and treat training. All that stuff is perfect. Use treats to expedite compliance for treats, uh, for, for trick training, obedience, all that kind of training. But when it comes to dysfunctions, the industry is relying on dysfunction by treating it with food. Go, go, next time you go out on the street to a shopping mall, go take a look at how many people are treating themselves with food when they have a dysfunction. You won't find very many people because they don't do that. Maybe they have alcohol and so forth, those types of substance abuses, okay. Self-inflicted, premeditated, obsessive, addictive, okay. But look at the people who actually have issues and how do they deal with it. They just deal with it. I had an ex-girlfriend that I went out with for a couple of years and she was awesome. And she said uh, when she'd have some real difficulties with her ex, like he was, he was quite a work of work of anyways. So when she had difficulty and he would make her feel really bad just by his behavior. And she sometimes fall into a bit of a depression herself. You know what she would say after a few days or sometimes a week or two, she would say, okay, the pity party is over. The pity party is over, is what she would say. And then she would just go, all right, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to live my life again. She's in a far better place than he is as a human being. Just pay attention to what you believe inside of your heart. Don't listen to the people out there. If you cry for help for your dog, put in your post no negative comments. Because the reason why you're posting with your reactive dog, the dangerous dog, skittish dog, is because you need help. You're as raw as you can be, and the last thing you need is a bunch of losers who tell you to kill your dog. You're asking in your most raw, painful form, publicly for help. The last thing you need is a bunch of losers telling you to go kill your dog. And those people, I always say to them, I hope you don't own a dog again.
All right, so that's my Monday thing, my Monday rail. And, um, you know, just, it's just, it's been a, it's been a tough week of dealing with people who are constantly told to kill their dogs. So, all right. Um, so this episode is what I look for in hiring and recommending a trainer. And so I've got some of this stuff scripted out here and I'm going to try to keep this format a bit cleaner and I'm in 20 minutes or so maybe another 15 minutes. And I should be done. I want to keep it shorter. I'm going to go back to all my old previous episodes that I've done and I'm going to, it's going to take me a while, but I'm going to try to uh, edit them down into smaller, instead of two hours, <laughs> into like 20 minutes, half an hour. I'm going to try to do that with key points and I'll repost those up in a different um, thing. And then, um, you know, I, I got to make it cleaner um, as, as this uh, social media person told me to do. Um, Okay, so here's questions, and they're not in no particular order, but questions to ask a potential trainer, right? This is stuff you want to say to the trainer. Hey, I'm just wondering. I'm just wondering. So uh, one thing I didn't include here was when you can't – oh, okay, actually, do include it in the bottom. Okay, sorry. Uh, ask the trainer. Try to do it by phone. Or in person, if you got to do it by email, you got to do it by email. But you want to hear the reaction, right? You hear, listen to the tone of the voice, and you say to them, "How many dogs have you recommended to be killed?" That's as simple as that. Don't you know? It's better if you can talk to them on the phone because then you get them off guard. They're like, right, and then the head starts melting like in Indiana Jones, Temple of Doom. Ah, so um, ask them, "How many dogs have you recommended to be killed?" So I might be in a unique position. I have a zero kill rate, a zero medication rate, zero, zero treat rate. I have, I have zero, zero, zero across the board. I accept dogs that come to me as is. I have no control over what kind of dog, who they are, their history. All I know is that they're predatorial or they're extremely dangerous. All I know is that they have attempted to hurt people viciously, if not attempted to kill people and or dogs. So, Skill sets, completely different. If you guys go take a look at one of my uh, YouTube channel uh, videos, there's a, there's a guy, another trainer is like, oh, you know, you call yourself the most, uh, uh, the, the top expert in the world of extremely dangerous dogs. And I, and I was like, okay. And I said, what do you mean? And he goes, well, you said you do it. Do you have any proof? And I, I, I waited a day on purpose. Then I responded back to him and I just said, this is what I've done, da, 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 da. And then I added on my media links for, from the newspapers so he knew I wasn't lying. And then he's had no response beforehand. But the truth is, unlike anybody else in my, in my, any of my colleagues, send me a dog, I don't care. I'll accept. Not because I'm brave or anything and stupid, it's because I know exactly what to do with your dog. It doesn't matter if your dog is it's a mild little issue, I know exactly what to do. It's a gift that I have been given, shared by God with me, but it is something that I teach humans, I teach owners how to do it themselves. So it's not that difficult. That's why I'm saying when I hear people talking about killing their dog, it's like, oh my gosh. And then when people tell them to kill their dog, it's even worse. Because it shows the industry itself has no idea what the heck they're doing. And they're desperately trying to protect their egos. Behavioral euthanasia, my gosh. It's like trying to operate on somebody with rusty tools rusty knives, surgery, it's just bizarre. So again, ask how many dogs have you re recommended to be killed? If it's a high kill rate or they can't answer you, then you know it's a huge problem with these people, which means that you will eventually hear if your dog is dysfunctional beyond their skill set, which usually doesn't take much nowadays, they will blame your dog. Your dog, oh, I've never seen a dog like this before. Your dog's the worst dog. Your dog is just that way, um, blah, blah, blah. Your dog's quality of life sucks. Dude, your quality of arrogance sucks. So how many dogs have you recommended to be killed? You know, is there an acceptable amount of dogs to be killed? In my books, no, but you'll have to play that by ear. If they can't answer you, then you know there's a problem. You know that, you know they don't, it's a sign that they don't know what to do. 
Would you rather hire someone that you go and say, how many dogs have you, how many, how many dangerous dogs do you work with? Oh, I work with dangerous dogs all the time. Okay. How many dangerous dogs have you killed? Recommended to be killed. Well, you know, sometimes they get like that and I do have to recommend them to be killed. Okay. So you don't have a zero kill rate. And they'll be like, well, no, that's impossible. Right off the bat, you know, the excuse is going to happen. Second question is, how many dogs have you recommended to be medicated? Yes, <laughs> very funny, very funny, Christina. Um, um, what's this dog, Mary? Mary, what's this dog? You saying? I know this dog had no that had no training and respect. The dog bit this guy's daughter. She had to have stitches. Animal control came and took the dog. I learned about this yesterday. I'm sure the dog is dead now. Not even questioned about the dog's life. Yeah. Uh, Mary is exactly the dog is blamed for the human ineptitude, abdication of responsibility, not being responsible. I mean, we drive our car and we hit somebody, we're 100% responsible. It doesn't matter. We're 100% responsible. So, uh, getting back to the thing is, how many dogs have you recommended to be medicated? That's a tough one for a lot of people. It's, it's an easier answer given by, by trainers and behaviors because it's, I didn't kill the dog. I just recommended the dog to be medicated. You know, um, if that is a difference between the dog living and dying, then it's a difference between the dog living and dying. Uh, my, my recommended medication rate is zero. And the dogs I deal with are dogs who people said that could never, not people, but well-known people that said could never be medicated or trained or whatever. No medication. Uh, but again, if it's the difference between your dog living and dying, uh, you know, it's Sophie's choice in that sense. But you want to, again, find out what the rate is. And here's the thing is, if you're asking somebody, a trainer, a behaviorist, well, how many dogs have you recommended be killed? They got to know. They can't just go and say, oh, I don't really know. So you're just writing out drug opioid prescriptions to everybody, so to speak. You know, the doctors out there are just killing people from drug overdoses, uh, addicting them. To, you just So they don't know how many they've, they've done. Is that the same thing when it comes to these dogs? Well, you, you don't know how many dogs you've recommended to be killed. You don't know how many dogs you've recommended to be medicated. You see so many dogs that it's just one big blur. And you just see, mm, kill, recommend, medicate. Blah, blah, blah. Dogs follow. So find out how many dogs they've recommended be killed. How many dogs they've recommended be medicated. Now the question is, which goes back to the, do, uh, the, 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 the professional's uh, aptitude and skill set. If you can't satisfactorily downtrain my dog, what happens then? So if you can't handle my dog, if you can't train my dog's, my dysfunctional dog's behavior, what will you do? What will you recommend? What will you say? Will you recommend a dog to be killed? Will you recommend a dog to be medicated? Will you recommend different tools? What will you use to say? Or will you just admit that you don't know? And then this leads on to the next point. Do you have other trainers that you would recommend? So that's another part is where you're saying to them, okay, basically, if I don't think you can do it, who would you recommend that could do it? When people ask me that, I tell them there's nobody that works at my level. Right off the bat, without any arrogance, there's no one that works at my level because I only deal with specific aspects of dogs psychologically. When it comes to the parts of the, uh, the traditional trainers and the treat trainers and all that stuff, I don't have anyone that I recommend as per se, but I do have people that I would recommend that I believe share the same perspective about dogs and the psychology of dogs, and then we go from there. If you have someone that you ask them, who would you recommend? The first thing off the head is going to go, oh, shoot, they're looking to go to my competitor, right? Normal, normal, normal question, normal reaction from anybody. If I was to go buy a car from a dealer, do you know who else? And I'm like, hey, you know, I want to buy this uh, red Lexus. And then they'll say, oh, we don't have a red Lexus. And then I say, well, where should I go to get a red Lexus? 
they're going to say right off the bat, oh, no, no, the guy's going to buy his car from someone else. Uh, you know what? Let me look on the computer. And he goes, oh, we have, we have a, uh, I've got a red Lexus in the system. It's on its way. It'll be here in two weeks. I used to do car transport, so I know all this game. Uh, it'll be here in two weeks or one week or whatever. It's on the rail, whatever. And then it turns out that the car was brought in from another dealership or that they looked through the inventory system through, you know, for those of you who do cards and all stuff, Odessa, Mannheim, and all these other aspects of um, – uh, dealer auto network structures um, so they'll find you the car because they know you're gonna go somewhere else so when you ask the trainer do you have anyone else that you would recommend you can either ask them before during or after the the, the, the session if you're not happy and you just find out who they say and you can look at the quality of that trainer that they would recommend because it's a reflection on the person you're just standing in front of asking the same question then you Go from there and see who they recommend and what that person's like and what their technique skill and you may find it's the same or similar I mean similar or different from your current trainer that you're using but you want to know it's not a reference as per se because references you know whatever it's it's finding who they associate with you know another thing actually I don't have down here which uh, I'm gonna note now is checking out for when there are um, videos of the trainer, of the dog's behavior from start to finish. You see a lot of videos by trainers and behaviors, usually trainers, that have 18 second long, 18 seconds. The video is 18 seconds. Or it's a couple of minutes or it's the after aspects of the dog. You know, two weeks later, here's the dog. Dude, let's see where the dog is in one session. You know, I, I get people who have hired trainers for multiple sessions. It shouldn't take more than one session to know exactly what is wrong with your dog and how to address it. Additional sessions will be follow up, but don't fumble in the dark with somebody who's like, oh, well, you know, next session we're going to try this and we're going to try that and uh, blah, blah, blah. You want to hire the star quarterback and not the guy who is in the backyard still playing catch, touch football, flag football, right? Because your dog suffers at the end of the day. It's your dog that suffers, not you. Your dog gets incorrect training. They learn how to go and, and they learn to make adaptations for the entire aspect, not just the previous behavior and the previous training and all the other stuff. They also learn the new stuff on top of it. So then they become even more aware of what's going on so incorrect training right like they said you know if you do construction carpentry right measure twice cut once teach your dog properly the first time don't quibble about pennies and dimes and hire a good trainer that know what they're doing with a low medication rate with a low kill rate that's what you want you don't want to you just that's just making common sense here. Another question to ask, what are the tools you use when working with a dog? Do you use treats? Which they always will say yes. Like 97% will say yes. So yes is yes. You know my, my opinion, perspective, and all that. And... Um, you know, I, I had some, uh, actually a couple of people who've written to me and said, you know, James, I know you don't like using treats. And I said, I've said to these people, it's not that I don't like using treats. I just don't need them. I use, the level I work with dogs that are beyond the skill set of bite level six people, I don't need the treats. I believe in them for, for expediting obedience and trick training and all that stuff. But the dogs that are reactive, attacking people, attacking other dogs, who cares? It's simple. It's easy. It's straightforward. So that's why I, I'm not offended when people, because people go, okay, right? Because they don't want to, you know, they don't want to offend me or they don't want to be rude or whatever. Ask me point blank. Ask me the question. I don't care. Ask me anything. I'll tell you the truth. I don't not believe in treats. I just don't need them. 
and I'm trying to convince the world that they don't need it either. And the people who hire me realize it. And the people in my reactive dog group and all that, they realize it. They see it from my firsthand assistance of them. Prince, the, the pit bull for those of you who have been following, all that stuff. Okay, so you want to ask what the tools are that they're using uh, when working with a dog. So what would you use? Would you use a, a regular collar? You know, and you don't, don't ask them. Just in, uh, invite them in to respond to you. You know what I mean? I'm not saying it's entrapment. Just ask them, what do you use? Do you use choke collars? Do you use e-collars, shock collars? Right, these brute force devices, in my opinion. I, I had somebody come to one of my group sessions, and it was really unfortunate um, because they have a small dog, and they wanted to use a prong collar on their dog because they were told to use a prong collar on their dog. And, you know, what I do is completely different. It works very quickly. Everyone that's come to my group sessions went, wow. Everyone I've worked with has went, like, wow. And I say, yeah, but it's not wow. It's simple. And so somewhere along the lines, uh, these people were told to use a prong collar on their dog. And I said, you know, it, it's a brute force device, right? I'm trying to convince this person. And then I said, you know, just a regular collar, fabric collar is what you need. Maybe a martingale, a slip collar with a cloth, fabric thing in case your dog is a flight risk, harness, etc. all those things. But using a prong or shock collar is really a brute force aspect. It's really um, an, an, an inability to pay attention and be responsible. And especially if the dog is a small dog. This is a dog under 30 pounds. Under 30 pounds. I'm using regular fabric collars with 150, 160, 180 pound dogs that are digging in, as I've said before, they dig into the ground to attack other dogs or other people in that behavior, two to three times their body weight. So over 500 pounds that they're digging in to pull me forward. I'm using a regular two inch fabric collar. I'm only picking Great Danes. That's all I, that's all I look for, for my own personal work. I'm looking for one again, and I know that I'm, the one I'm looking for has got to be wanting to kill me. And it's not as an embellishment or euphemism, but they're going to want to kill me because of their behavior, their history. I'm not going to use a shock collar. I'm not going to use a prong collar. I'm not going to use a, a, a pheromone collar. I'm just going to use a regular collar. How do I best connect to another being, another someone, unless I'm just being truthful and straightforward with them and not adding in artificial devices. How do I understand the true behavior of a dog if I'm artificially forcing them into compliance? Is that some great satisfaction as a human being? And what was really shocking was this person said, um, my vet, is, is, is a really nice vet and blah, 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 and a holistic vet. And I was like, oh boy. So apparently this vet told this person that a prong collar does not hurt the dog's throat. The vet said to the person, the prong collar does not hurt the dog's throat but a regular straight fabric collar will hurt the dog's trachea and all that stuff. And I've talked about this in my past session as well, a uh, past vlog. That's about as dumb as you can get from an educated person. It's as dumb as you can get. It, it's literally like the vet might as well say, and the earth is flat. And the moon landing was faked. Hi, Lincoln. I said, have you ever tried a prong collar? Have you ever put one on your throat? No. I've done so. I can't go and complain about something if I haven't tried it myself. And it hurts. And yes, our skin is softer and everything and yada, yada. But the reality is these prongs are like little fork edges 
and they're there. And once they get stuck on the dog's throat, they dig in. They don't they don't just scratch as they pull in tight. They also dig in. Have you ever had anyone when your kids take their nail and they dig their nail into your skin, your brother or sister? The prong collar is worse, and it's right around the entire dog's neck. I've seen pictures where the dog has worn a prong collar where it's went right through. My beloved Nero, his whole neck, because he was with a prong collar when he was left outside for three three years in Alabama, all went white from the scarring. The skin doesn't die unless the skin's been injured. And it, yes, it hurts. The dogs feel pain. So this vet, any vet, anybody saying, any professional, any colleague of mine saying that a prong collar doesn't hurt the dog, it's a person who does not understand pain or empathy, does not have true compassion. There's no compassion in somebody. Yeah, Kim. Uh, there's no compassion in someone who thinks that a dog is just a stupid, dumb thing. They're not. Your dog will defend you to the end of their life to protect you. Talk to anybody out there. Unless you're a firefighter or a police officer or a paramedic or somebody along those life-saving aspects of the emergency department. Or you got best friends that you know you can trust. Most people won't do that to save your life. Right, the Good Samaritan, most people won't. It, it, it's just, well, it's, just, it's such an ignorant, uneducated statement to say that the prong collar doesn't hurt, but the flat collar does. So the other thing is that the prong collar on a small dog, especially, the prong gets, right, here's the trachea, it's gonna hurt the dog's throat. A fat, flat fabric collar goes around and encompasses about 80% of the dog's throat, right? Because it's going to go right to the top there before it pinches in, uh, not pinches, before it goes uh, closed with a flat collar. If it's a martingale, it'll pull all the way in. But then you have full pressure on the entire part of it, uniform fabric. When you do it with a prong collar, you're yanking the dog with the poke, pokey part, the, the metal prongs into the dog's throat and for this person to tell me that it doesn't hurt their dog because the vet the holistic vet told me it doesn't hurt the dog but a fabric collar will hurt the dog's throat and the trachea that vet should go back to school and try to put on a second wheel onto his tricycle out of the three wheels i just so find out what tools the trainer is going to use if your vet says stuff like that, that, oh, a prong collar doesn't hurt the dog, find another vet, because you're not gonna get a vet with compassion, because if they already think a prong collar is painful, Minky, stop it. If you, uh, Lincoln is uh, eating a bone here, and Minky's trying to get it. So, it should be considered abuse uh, having a prong collar on a dog, but they don't, because dogs are property. And that's the difference. If the dog is property, then you don't have to worry about creating an empathy. You don't have to worry about correlating uh, sentience with the dog. So there's no legal avenue to pr pursue. There's no legal aspect of it at all. Well. There's no jurisprudence that exists recognizing dogs having feelings and limited legal rights. You know, Oregon, uh, New York, they're trying on it. I think Australia as well was working on that. But there's nothing there that's fundamentally put into law. Nothing's going to be jurisprudence. There's nothing that case law, you know, jurisprudence, case law, none of that's going to be established for a generation or three. So if they use a prong collar or all these other aspects of it, ask them why. Ask them, does it hurt the dog? You know, the mechanical devices, the sound, compressed air, all that stuff. All it does is scare the dog, and, it, and then the sound of compressed air is a high-pitched sound. Imagine if it hurts your dog's ear if you're doing it right by the dog's head. They hear it. It's like, why do you have to do it? Why don't you just use your voice and yell at your dog instead, right? Well, not yell like, ah, but just, yell, you know, with a very loud voice. I, 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 just more volume. You don't have to use these, these, these artificial tools to help the dog if you don't worry about your skill set. So these are professionals, right? Uh, so you want to get them away from these parts of using the tools. If they're using the tools, there's a really good chance you're going to end up using it on your dog if you leave them for a board and train. Pretty good chance.
because then they have to protect their ego because when they return your dog to you, when you come pick up your dog after a week, after paying $3,000 US to have your dog treated, they want to be able to prove to you your dog's compliant. So they intimidate your dog when no one sees. That's why there's no cameras in most of those places. So you can't watch the training. Ask them to send you a video of your dog being trained. Well, you know, we don't have time for that. Really? You charge me $3,000? Uh, what are your thoughts on the Halty? Uh, hooligan gets too excited and pulls a leash when I walk him in a new area. People have told me that Halties will help him behave on walks. Um, you know, you can use a Halty. Just... You don't want to use it on a long-term basis. Uh, and I mean on a long-term basis. Like there's people who just every day use it, and then you see the wear marks that happen on the dog, right, with the halties around the face and on the, on the skin and all that. That's not just the only problem. Long-term use with a halty and heavy movement and jerking around the head and all that stuff, what ends up happening is long-term use will cause the nerves in the skin to become um, uh, damaged. So then your dog loses sensitivity in that part of it, right? It's like, you know, so you, you can use it, uh, Ivy, um, but just use it within reason, right? I mean, if he's excited because he's just, he's still a puppy though. Hooligan's still a baby. So, I mean, um, just, you know, people work on it. It's just one part is you want to be able to give him, Lincoln, Lincoln, you want to be able to work with him, with him on just a correction. When he gets too excited, Ivy, just just reset hula game. Calm him down. Don't let him run around. If he doesn't pay attention, then you don't continue the walk. I have uh, Anthony. Right, I got to put him up for adoption. I keep I just keep running out of time and forgetting to post things about him. But Anthony's eight, uh, 19 months of age, 160 pounds. So. I'll take him down to for a walk and he's all over the place and after 50 meters so 150 feet I just stop and he's and he starts wandering around all over the place like walk because there's no sidewalks in the area I live in so there's so it's a bit difficult so he starts wandering all over the road and you know that and then I just stop him again and I might get 200 meters away from the house like 600 feet I might get 200 meters away from the house and then I just stop and I look at my watch and go, okay, well, that was 25 minutes. And we're walking back in again. If he behaves when he walks, then we walk further. If he doesn't behave, then we go back in after 20, the same amount of time. And he slowly realizes, oh, I better behave because I'm not going to go out for a longer walk. Um, okay, do, so uh, the other question I asked your trainer, really, this is just a, a me, James, causing poop. Issue. This is me, James, disturbing, disturbing the stuff, right? As as Christina says, I got my sassy pants on today. Um, ask the trainer, behaviors, master dog trainer, dog expert. Do treats exist as a community? Uh, sorry, I'm gonna read this part. Do treats exist as a communication tool in the canine species? Do dogs use food to communicate with each other? Do dogs use food to give each other treats? And not for anything other than just to, you know, hey, dudes, what do you guys do? And I say, well, then if it doesn't exist as, uh, as a tool for, um, for training, I'm uh, sorry, communication in the species itself, the entire dog species, canine species, right? Now I'm talking about the domesticated dog, the, 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 the canine, the, you know, whatever. Um, then why are we using it? Why can't you just help my dog without using any medication or treats? Why can't you just help my dog with just using a regular collar? That's me causing a little bit of poop, causing, causing a little bit of disturbance there. Uh, yeah, he's 50 pounds running and it's so hard to control him when he pulls, LOL. So it's okay to use a halty as a training purposes. I'm a little hesitant as it looks a little inhumane. You know what you can do? This is another one like I always talk about. I talk about having a martingale on the bottom and a regular collar on the top. A regular fabric collar on the top, martingale on the bottom. You use a carabiner, a clip, attaching the two to the back of the dog. Uh, to the two loops. So the martingale is on the bottom, the regular collar is on the top, the clip goes between the two, and then you attach the leash to the top leash, uh, to the top collar. So in this case with the martingale and all that stuff, you could probably try to have one connected to his throat, the regular collar, and then one connected to his martingale, and that might help. I'm not really sure how it works, so I mean, halty, so I might be talking out of my, the dumb part of my head, but um, you could try it that way and see it. But, you know, 
I, it's okay to use it. And it's not like I'm struggling or whatever on that part. Just want to be careful that it doesn't get used too much. Right? Otherwise, then it's like, oh, okay. But, I mean, I mean, hooligans got a lot of energy for sure. Um, you know, if you can just stop and not go anywhere and then stop and then that's it, right? So, um, anyways, uh, we can talk uh, another time about this IV. I can send you, um, we can we can text or uh, make a phone call and we can have a talk about it. Like I said, right, lifetime, you need to help uh, anybody who, who hires me, lifetime help, right? So, if you need help, we'll make a phone call, we'll talk. Um, there's no charge for that. So that's about communication tools. I'm almost, I'm at 50 minutes, five, zero minutes. Okay. Um, and then ask them as well. Um, uh, what are some of the extreme tools you may use with a very difficult dog? That's a tell. That's a tell. So you have a dog that is really reactive and dangerous. What do you do? What will you do to help my dog? How will you deal with that? And then they talk about the shock colors or whatever and so forth like that. And that's also a very difficult question for most people to answer, just regular people to answer too. Well, what do you do if the dog is too difficult, too dangerous to do? What do you do then? And like, ah, and then you catch them on whether or not they've euthanized dogs. Do you see what I mean? Everything that I talk about, it's just multi-leveled on it because that's how we have to look at dogs, right? The, the, the quantum and processing, same with human beings. So yeah, what are some of the extreme tools you may use um, with very difficult dogs? Next one is what aspects do you use when working with a dog? So what type of techniques that they're using? How do they address their dog? Do they understand the dog processing? If you have a trainer like Learberg who's trolled me and he says things like, well, you gotta lure the dog, L-U-R-E, it's like, okay, this guy, you don't wanna hire. You don't wanna, don't wanna hire a guy like that. Dogs aren't lured by the stupidity. Luring a dog is when you leave a piece of bait out in a trap because the dog you're trying to save or, or, or trap, and then the, that's luring. When you have a tree, and then Learberg foolishly is like, oh, well, you know, dog, see how the dog follows me? And I'm luring him to me, so he's paying attention on the leash. No, your dog is so fast processing human behavior at one-tenth of a second that your dog is actually telling by your whole physical physicality of movement that you're gonna move your arm. Your dog sees that already. Your dog knows where your hand is gonna go by your natural behavior, human behavior, so your dog's tracking. Your dog's not being lured, silly boy. Your dog is anticipating your movements before you even think of doing it consciously. And that's why I say Learberg is a mediocre treat trainer who's commercialized mediocrity. Uh, what aspects do you use when working? Okay, yeah. You know, and other parts like this positive reinforcement, all that stuff. Honestly, I have no idea what they're even talking about. I don't read any of this stuff. And not because of I'm so great, it's because if I read any of that stuff, it would have tainted what I'm doing and it would have probably screwed up any of my skill set and my gift. If I took classes, I wouldn't be doing this. I wouldn't be working with dangerous dogs. I would have been taught that you can't help a dangerous dog. That's what's out there right now. If you can't, if you can't address a dangerous dog, the dog gets killed. That's what I would have been taught. And then I would have went, okay, no use trying with this dog because this dog's too dangerous. I could kill it. In this case, on my end, Just, anyways, um, okay, uh, yeah, so like all these, all these skill sets and these, 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 these things that they're talking about and these accreditations and these, I go to school every six months to upgrade and to maintain my credits. In other words, I go to school every day so I can keep paying affiliation fees that are hidden tax be part of this industry that's not self-regulated and is telling me that they have a 60% success rate. Man, these sassy pants are pretty awesome today, Christina. Uh, I should take more time off next time. But that's the reality. The methods and the tools, none of it works. The accreditation is awesome. Take a dangerous dog, a true dangerous dog. Bring your certificates with you. Bring your bag full of treats and try to work with that dangerous dog. Give them the treats. Dangerous dog ain't gonna take the treats. Dangerous dog is gonna kind of come after you still. 
then take out your accreditations, take out your certificates. Maybe your dog will, maybe the dog will take it, or maybe the dog will rip it to shreds or just attack your hand as you try to give your dog accreditation certificates. The animal kind accreditation certificate from BCSPCA that couldn't even train a puppy that they had to kill. And so credits, certificates, treats, are positive, are, are positive, arf, arf, bark, bark, positive, that's me, arf, arf, bark, bark. All these things don't work. None of it works. But the industry is stuck on this because it's your money that you're paying them to tell you that you're wrong about your own dog, that the intuition that you have inside of you is wrong. So another question then is, because I'm going to go over an hour now. Arrgh. You win, people. Even if it's, even, yeah. All right. Uh, what is your opinion about my own dog's psychology? So when you bring your dog to the, to the trainer and you actually meet them, you know, I'm giving psychology profiles of people's dogs online by email by looking at the photos and the description. So like I said, I'm, I'm obviously uniquely gifted, but these people there have to see your dog in person. That's totally cool. What do you think about my dog's psychology? What's his issues? Okay, he's fearful, he's insecure, he's reactive. Then you say, well, what's, what's the fear based out of? Oh, he's afraid of being attacked by other dogs. Okay, why is he afraid of being attacked by other dogs? Well, he got attacked by a dog, so he's afraid. Okay, so if he got attacked by another dog and he's afraid, which is something I already told you, why is he still afraid even though I'm trying to help him understand that he's not afraid anymore? Well, you know, your dog has learned this reaction to deal with other dogs and this is the way he protects himself. And, and you're like, okay, so how do I deal with it and what's the reason? What's his psychology? What's his dysfunction behind the fear? Don't give me the winter jacket a fear that encompasses everything inside the dog. Let's see, open up, expose. Let's see exactly all the issues that your dog has. My dog has, tell me what's wrong with my dog on the psychological, on the root basis, on that core little basis of what's wrong with my dog. Is it low self-esteem? Is it a high codependency rate? What? Is it a sense of self? Abandonment issues? Insecurity, unsecurity, what are the issues that my dog has that you are going to tell me is wrong with my dog in a psychological aspect? Don't just let a trainer or behavior say to you these generalized terms of fear, reactive, and st why? You're paying them two, three. In the case of Dr. Rebecca Ledger, Claudia Richter, you're paying them $400 for one hour. Make them work for it. Why is my dog fearful? What are the issues? I mean, I talk to people every day about issues with their dog, and they're like, you know, I've gone to this trainer, this trainer, et cetera, et cetera, and I don't know what the situation is, and they don't know what's going on, or they're trying, and they're telling me it's my fault, or it's my dog's fault, or right? They never say it's their fault. The, most trainers don't say, oh, it's my fault. I don't know what to do with your dog. Your dog is this. Your dog is that. <laughs> and then I say, well, so what's the psychological issues going on with your dog? Well, they said it's fear reactive. Okay, so what more? And like, well, that's all they said. Huh? And then I always send, when I see stuff like that, I just go, you know what? This is what's wrong with your dog. And this is what the issue is. And they have low self-esteem. They have the insecurity. And they have this. And this issue is probably relatable to that aspect of it. And then the, the, if it's two dogs, the, the bond between the two dogs, the codependency aspect is working in between the dogs. It's becoming an interdependency aspect of it. Or as one is happening because the other one's more confident than the other dog, da, 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 da. And they're like, oh. Can we talk on the phone then? Because I've given them more of a description than they'll ever receive because when everybody's just relying on these catchphrase descriptions, it's not enough, people. Ask and demand more of your trainer and behaviorist so then they step up their game and then they go back to their institutions, their accreditation facilities and go, you know what, I'm getting a lot more people asking me more than just fear, more about the psychology of our dogs, the psychosis of our dog. So we need to start looking to this academia perspective of it. 
And that's what I'm talking about. We start forcing them to work for their money so that they start forcing their higher ups to start looking at the reality. And you see the graduation of this thing. In 122 years from Pavlov, 1897, 122 years, dog training has not changed. It's still the same. Treats, 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 and they're still relying on that. And now they're just starting to talk about dogs having feelings and empathy and all that stuff. But because they're not able to come out right with it, they're grasping for this stuff. Ask your trainer what is the psychology of my dog and ask for detail. Don't let them get away with it. Don't, if they stammer, if they pause uncomfortably long, and you can tell they're pausing just as waste time, find somebody else. What is your opinion? Okay, another question is, what is your opinion about dogs having codependency issues? Funny, Christina. Uh, what is your opinion about dogs having codependency issues? Ask them that. That's the kind of word, codependency. It's the kind of word that will blow over a trainer's head if they don't know the dog's psychology, if they don't understand it. Every single dog I talk to, uh, the owner's about, there's a codependency quotient to it. It's either low, high, whatever. There's a dependency issue that goes on. Our dogs rely on us like, our, like they're our children. They look up to us. We're cross species. We're cohabitating with a different species that looks up at us with the most incredible respect and adoration and love. It's a dependency, a codependency. Makes sense. If they were dumb, stupid animals, they wouldn't be looking at us like that. They'd be trying to attack us because they're predators to begin with. Familial, right? John Pollock had said that before in regards to alpha male, alpha female, and the wolf pack. Mom and dad. You look at the familial structure of wolves. It's a similar aspect of it. And if there's a new animal, a new wolf that comes into the pack that earns its position in the pack, they become part of that family. It's not a silly, stupid, rudimentary comment of, of, of pack aspect of it. So I ask them, what do you think of the dogs having codependency? Do you think dogs can have low self-esteem? They'll say yes about low self-esteem. They'll talk about insecurity, confidence, and all that stuff. But dependency, you won't find that. They're going to understand that. They won't be able to read that in your dog. But they have it. Because there's interdependent, interdependent, modular interdependency, non-modular interdependency, non-modular interdependency, codependency, ladder dependency. This, there's so much brilliant about dogs. You, you, you all, if you all could see what I see, you would have this incredible appreciation for life in general. And you would also be quite adamant about the way dogs are being treated so badly. Six million are killed annually in North America. Uh, next question is uh, to ask a trainer behaviorist, what is your opinion about how dogs process things? So ask them, how does your dog, how do, how do dogs see things? What do dogs react? How do dogs react? Why do dogs react? What, what, are, what does a dog do? What does a dog do this? What is, what is the issue that a dog will understand? Blah, 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 right? I talked that earlier about that guy, the troll Leerberg. And the point is that he's talking about luring the dog. He has no idea what he's talking about. That's why he, if you talk to a person like that, he has no idea. That's why I say, ask him what your opinion is of how a dog processes things. They won't know. And then the thing I didn't put down here, which is great, just came up in mind is, how fast does a dog process something. I say one-tenth of a second. I've given you examples. Take your dog to the park with the leash on. You let your dog run while with the leash on. So you're holding the leash. Your dog is straining, straining, and straining to, to, to bolt. The instant you let go of the leash before it's even touched the ground, your dog has processed the physical input cognitively down to its wheels, so to speak, so that the dog then launches themselves physically. Three steps in one-tenth of a second because even before the leash has touched the ground, the dog is off. You take a treat, you hold it in front of your dog's face. While the dog's not paying attention or whatever, the instant you let go of that treat before it's touched the ground, your dog has snapped it out of the air. One tenth of a second process time. So then when you ask the trainer, how fast does a dog process things? 
If your trainer says, well, they try to process it pretty fast, you don't know what you're talking about. You're just saying things. But here's the way to catch them. How does a dog process things? How fast is a dog processing? Well, they process things very fast. Oh, they process things very fast? Yes, they do. Dogs are very quick. They're, they process things very fast. Oh, so that means there's no such thing as unpredictability. And then you get them. They're like, oh, uh, well, you know, some dogs do things without any reason why. But then if the dog is processing things at a tenth of a second or so fast, doesn't that mean it's rooted in something? Does not that mean that the behavior is situated, rooted in something? And that's why the dog's reacting to something, but we're too slow to catch it. And then you'll make the trainer go, oh, uh, um, yeah, well, you know, some dogs are just like that. And they start blaming the dog because they don't have an answer for you. I have always said, there's no such thing as an unpredictable dog. Everything is rooted in the dog's history. His historical, the dog's historical context, what the dog has experienced in their life, and it's always abuse, because, right? Fear, something has happened to the dog that has brought them to that point. They're not processing unpredictably. They're not acting without any, any relatable aspects of it. They are processing and reacting at the speed that the dog is naturally reacting at. If they can pick up that treat out of the midair, if they can bolt off before the leash touches the ground, that's not unpredictable, is it? So when a dog reacts negatively to someone or something or another animal, it's not unpredictable. It's a tenth of a second process time. It's also situated in how the dog processes memory and time, as I talk about that, abstract memory, yada, 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 right? So there's that. Another thing to tell when you're contacting a, a potential trainer is when you send an email to the potential trainer, to a million of them, to one of them, doesn't matter. Just say, uh, you know, my dog is this and this, da 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 da, and then see what the trainer responds back to you. If the trainer does not ask you for any information about your dog, even your dog's name, age, breed, uh, pictures, those are things to be aware of. That means that they're seeing your dog is just a bottle, an inanimate object that is reflective of their lack of understanding, compassion, empathy, intuition, skill. All they're trying to do is rest on their ego. Every single person that's ever contacted me, even if they're just inquisitive and asking or serious or people who are trying to get free advice from me all the time, I always say send me clear photos of your dog's eyes, face, Lincoln. Uh, always send me clear photos of your eyes, dog's face, and body so you can get a sense of them, their history, and their overall issues. I always do. And I ask for other personal information about their dog. Not about the people, but about their dog. Because to me, I... Lincoln, stop. I always use that information to construct. Like accident reconstruction, I use that to construct your dog's personality. It's the same thing. Lincoln, Minky, it's the same thing. Lincoln, stop. Stop, Lincoln. Okay, come. Come here, Lincoln. Hi, Lincoln. Thank you. Um, so I, I always ask, it, right? And, and it's important to ask for information. It's the same thing if I, you know, like, like you know, I'm, I'm on, you know, when I'm on the dating apps and all stuff, I don't just look at the photos and go, oh, okay, great, she looks great, and, uh, you know, I'd love to, to, to contact with her, match with her, or whatever it is. I look at the profile, I look at the face to see if there's stuff there that I find not just superficially attractive to me, but also the eyes, does she have nice eyes, does she have a kind face, does she have you know, uh, uh, intelligence, uh, is she a wise person and all that, like the brain, right, they say the beauty fades, whatever, but I look for those things that tell tell the personality of the person, and then I read, I'll read her description, and the description doesn't, Right, doesn't matter. She could be the most gorgeous person in the world, but the, the if it doesn't match, it's like we're just going to be stupid with each other, as in we're going to hate each other. We're not. There's not. It's never even going to meet up. 
no matter what. I need to know about the person, whether or not I can have an emotional connection with them. Same thing with the dog. You send me a picture of a photo of your dog, I need to know. When you send it to your trainer, potential trainer, behaviors, wherever the heck you live, you want to find out how much do they really want to know about your dog. How much information is important to them? What are they asking about your dog? Think of it the same way as if your child came home from school and said, hey, you know that new kid that just started that nobody knows anything about his family, but he just started school yesterday? Um, can I go over and hang out at his place? And you're like, who is this guy? No, we have to meet the parents first. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, what do they do? What's his name? Where is he from, right? You're going to ask a million questions about your child. Your dog is just as important to you. You've got to ask those questions. Uh, does a trainer behaviors work directly in front of you? Or your dog, oh sorry, does it, okay, so does it, uh, these are questions that, these are notes that I put down um, over the weekend, because like I said, I'm going to start structuring things even though I'm off an hour and 10 minutes now. Um, does the trainer behaviorist work directly in front of your dog or hides behind furniture, etc.? So that's a question to ask before you spend $400 on a PhD behaviorist that writes a newspaper column. Do you Stand right in front of the dog and you work with the dog. I hold the leash and my dog's reactive and dangerous and will try to bite people. Do you stand there? What do you do? Do you, do you what, what do, do, do I bring the dog out? You want to put a muzzle on? They'll say, no, put the dog, this, oh, this is what they always say. Put, leave the dog in the kennel, leave the muzzle on, put the dog in a different room. We'll talk about your dog. It's like, okay, why would we want to talk about my dog while my dog is here? Wouldn't you rather just work with my dog right in front of you? Why can't we just talk on the phone then instead? If I was going to have a coffee chat with you, I might as well just do it over the phone. So you want to know that from the behaviors, the trainer and all that stuff, whether or not they're working in front of your dog. Every single person that has a dog that I've worked with, just bring your dog out. Put your dog on leash. If you think he's going to bite me, if he's dangerous, she's dangerous, a dog, put a muzzle on if that's the case, but let's just see how it goes. Free range, whatever it is, let's, let's, you're paying me in, you know, to work with your dog. I'm not going to sit there behind a, a kitchen counter or behind a pony wall. Right? You're, you're, you're going to pay somebody $400 an hour, not me. I would, I, I would never ethically charge $400 an hour. Just ethically, I couldn't charge that. It's just disgusting. I don't need to buy Gucci shoes or Gucci high heels, I guess. Um, acid trainer behaviors. Where do you go? Do you, do you out there working with a dog? What, what do you do? Are we going to stand around and talk for 20 minutes while, our dog is, while my dog is in the kennel? What, what, what do we do? You want to have your value. You want to demand more of your trainer, your behaviors, your PhD, academic. Are you going to be working with my dog directly or are we going to stand around talking for 20 minutes or 40? I heard 40 minutes once for one person. 40 minutes. 40 minutes to talk to one person about the dog before she even saw the dog and then threw treats at the dog. You, you could do it yourself and then take that 400 bucks and buy yourself, you know, a nice dinner, wine, helicopter over to Victoria for two, actually. What is it, like 180 bucks for a helicopter, a helijet over to Victoria? It's a round trip. You could do it yourself and then just throw a tree and go, oh, dang, my dog's dangerous. You want the trainer to say, yes, I'll work with you. And you don't want the trainer to show up with some dumb anti-bite suit, you know, the big puffy suit they use in, in, in what do they call it, the, 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 the tack dog training and all that stuff. I saw a video of a guy in Florida. Uh, someone sent me a link to that. And, oh, my gosh. I was like, oh, look at Mr. Stay Puff from Ghostbusters is here. And the guy can barely walk. And he's going like this. And he goes, oh, yeah, the dog's attacking me. He's really reactive. And I'm like, dude, you're wearing a freaking. Uh. So find out what they're going to do once they meet up with your dog. 
you don't want the trainer or behaviors to say, I'm, we'll talk a bit and all that stuff. Say, well, then let's just talk on the phone if that. I don't want to pay you to talk on the phone to tell me what it is. And if the trainer is right there and they go, oh, yeah, you know, let's stand over here while we leave your dog in the kennel. No. And, and it's happened to somebody else too as well, right? Some of you who are watching this know this. The trainer just hides and says, no, don't put your dog away. You want somebody who's going to say, just bring your dog out. Let's just see how they are and go from there. Just make sure I'm safe. Make sure the dog's not going to attack me. Make sure you don't let go of the leash. Make sure the leash is on tight. Make sure the collar's on tight. Make sure the muzzle's on tight. Now you see the Axel video where, I, where, where Axel muzzle punches me in the face. So what? I continue. I don't care. Who cares? The dog's safe. So what? You get punched in the face. You get punched in the face. I mean, I've, I've fallen just walking in my place one time. And I hurt my head way worse than, than getting punched or bitten. Well, bitten is not the same, actually, but getting bitten hurts. So that's all. So just, you know, do they work in front of you or do they hide behind furniture? And you can tell them beforehand, you know, if you end up hiding behind furniture, I'm not paying you. <laughs> um, and then another question is, ask your trainer, what's the most difficult dog that you've ever worked with directly? Not throwing the treats over, but what? is the most difficult dog you've worked with directly. That's going to be a sign of whether or not they're fabricating a storyline for you. If they're prevaricating, they're constructing a story, a history, a reliable source. Make a mental note of what they tell you so you know when they ask them again anecdotally whether or not the story is similar in retelling. A lot of people will say, I work with this dog that did this and did this and this, da, da, da. I'm like, okay, so how do you address it? And then you again find out whether or not they use certain tools, all these things, right? You, you see what I mean? All these questions are not meant to entrap. These questions are meant to elucidate, to let us see more. Did I ever tell you that I have a younger brother who's quite a successful lawyer? So that might be the paranoia that we have in the family that's, that's, that's come over. Sorry, um, it's not paranoia. Um, it's just, you gotta ask all these questions and every question's gotta lead into something else. When it comes to asking questions, like, you know, you, you ask a friend of yours, I mean, your friend, uh, sorry, I'll say, your friend contacts you one day and they're despondent, and they're really hurt and they're crying and they're miserable. And then and you're like, what happened, right? And they say, oh, my boyfriend broke up with me. And you're like, okay, well, why did your boyfriend break up with you? And then you start asking questions of what happened and whose fault it is. And you're trying to determine what's going on. You're trying to determine whether or not uh, your friend and her boyfriend, if it's re salvageable, is there uh, right reconciliation or is it just a misunderstanding? You're going to work through all these things to try to figure out what it is. This is exactly what my questions are. And this is exactly the questions when I ask people. Right, I, I've asked people questions about sending them pictures and, and photos and history of their dog, and some people will just send like one paragraph, and other people will send two pages of stuff. It all reflects on the type of behavior the human being has themselves, and then you read the stuff. So even the the one paragraph or the two page part is all indicative, re, re, reflective, and relational to the human being's perspective and perception of their own dog and where they value their dog's survival at and progress. Um, yeah, so just ask who their most difficult dog they've worked with. And, you know, if you don't believe that they're telling the truth, then just say, hey, do you have proof of it? Can I talk to the owner? Like on my end, I, I, I was talking to somebody, um, recently and they said actually it's more than one person too uh they said hey you know what um there's a lot of trainers out there that say they do this and they do that and they make these huge promises and then when it turns out to come to meet my dog and i explain to my dog they're like oh no we can't deal with this dog no we don't do we don't work with this kind of dog because the dog is too much for them so you just want to find out where their skill set is so that way you're not hiring somebody who says they can do what they actually can't do. Minky. No, Minky. Thank you. So you want to make sure, like, like when I'm dealing with dogs, right, throughout this whole conversation, I'm focusing on the dog 100%. I'm making sure that I'm, my attention is to these guys. I'm not talking to somebody else in the, right, I'm, I'm not looking around. I'm paying attention so they understand I'm, I'm talking to them. Um, 
But yeah, so all these questions are designed and you can come up with your own questions as well to ask about what is it? What are the things? What's going on? Who's this? Who's that? What do you do? What do you think? What have you experienced? What's your feelings about uh, this? What have you, have you ever heard of behavioral euthanasia? Have you ever recommended it? All these questions are meant to encapsulate the trainer's skill set. And any of those questions and questions of your own that you have to ask of the trainer doesn't jive. Ask more questions. And if those don't satisfy you, find somebody else. My problem is I always get the people, I get the proactive people like Ivy, which is phenomenal. I get the proactive people like, okay, you know, I got an issue. I want to get it addressed before it gets worse. Because I know if it gets worse, then the love of my life is going to become the horror of my life. And I'm going to be so stressed out because I am afraid then become such a bad dog. They're going to create an issue that, will negatively impact their lifespan. Just, yeah, anyways, okay. So I'm gonna end this off. Uh, that's Minky. Uh, that's, I'm gonna end this off. So uh, an hour and 20 minutes, so I went 40 minutes over, I apologize. Uh, I'm gonna try on Wednesday, I'll be back on Wednesday. If you have any questions, any comments whatsoever, feel free to post them in there. Uh, anything that you're asking and I'll respond back to them. I hope that uh, the structure is a bit better now. Like it takes a lot of out of me. Um, if you can share my page, share my YouTube channel. If you can subscribe to my YouTube channel, if you haven't already, that'll help get the word out. Um, just to follow my work, to spread it out. You know, the stuff I'm talking about has 100% been proofed. Every part of it has been proofed. Everything I've ever talked about, I've discovered on my own. I just want to share this with the rest of the world for free. Why? Because we're going to save dogs. We're going to save lives. I'm not going to be able to take money with me to the grave. My gift is going to disappear. I want to. I want to share what I'm doing so that there will be better people than me, more talented people than me out there. I want to be the person that yes, set the ball rolling, but I want to see greatness come out of humanity so that we're not killing all these dogs unnecessarily, and we're not paying for someone to have Gucci shoes and drive a freaking Mercedes. Nothing wrong with it. If you're good and you're great, absolutely. Live the life, live the money that you earn honestly, but don't do it on the backs of dogs that you're recommending to be killed. Don't do it on the backs of dogs that you're dooming to death, knowing that the dog is far beyond your skill set. So what I want to do is I want to educate. I want to share what I'm doing. Um, Actually, what I'm going, I'm going to, I got to try to save up some money here to try to get some equipment to do a podcast. And when I do that, I'm going to transition that over onto YouTube. And if I can get that onto YouTube, I will. If not, then it's going to be on Facebook, whatever. But I'm going to try to do podcasts where I have it um, live training sessions with people. And it'll be a first come, first serve basis. And we'll say, okay, here's your dog. This is what you do. Boom, boom, boom. And it's going to be with no treats, no medication, etc. And we're going to change the world. And maybe I live this fantasy of it, of doing these things. And, and again, people are saying, you know, I shouldn't do it for free. Uh, just for now, absolutely. I'm going to keep doing what I can do to help save dogs and do what I can to share everything for people. Just, just asking for help from those of you who are watching and everything. Um, okay, so I will see you on Wednesday. Hi, William. This is William. William, stop. See how happy William is? Minky, no. No, Minky. No, Minky. No, Minky. So, Minky, right? So, William's getting all the issues. And then here comes the, here comes the crowd. Here comes the crowd. Right? William. 
So you see that even the behavior of how William's moving around, right? And he's, he's only, he's a small dog. He's about 110 pounds. So 110 pounds, he's got a lot of strength. Usually the dog is able to pick up about 50 to 70% of their body weight in their throat, right? When they go to kill somebody, or they go to, I'm oh, sorry. When they go to kill an animal, or they go to kill somebody, they can pick up about 50% of their weight, 50 to 70% of the weight, depending on the structure of the dog. Um, extremely powerful animals. But even that part of it, you just got to be steady. It's just like the dog jumping up and everything. You just got to be steady. Um, Anthony. 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 Right? So it's just, it's just a tone. Just a tone of voice. That's it. I'm not using the, the recall command. Just using his tone in a certain way. As if I'm saying the full word all together. Hi, silly boy. See, this is this is Anthony. He's up for adoption. See how big his eye. Look at his eye. Anthony, look at the camera. Look at the camera. <laughs> he's, such, he's such a funny dog. Anthony. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy yourselves. I'm going to go feed my dogs. Uh, these guys eat literally uh, like seven to ten pounds a day. All right, so that's me. Minky, stop, Minky. Right? Even when I'm talking to him, I'm making eye contact with Minky. Anthony, when I'm talking to him, I'm making eye contact with him, even if he's not looking. All these things, yada, yada. Anyways, uh, everybody have fun. Uh, everybody wang chung tonight for all you old people. Uh, I want to say thank you to Deborah and Susan for uh, an amazing invitation tonight for, uh, for dinner. Uh, it was delicious. Uh, I love home-cooked meals. It's probably one of my most favorite things uh, in my entire life to ever enjoy is, the, is a home-cooked meal. Um, it's the most fun. It's the most intimate thing that you can ever do uh, with another person or with a bunch of people. Is that really beautiful part of just food and wine or food and drink and just talking about things. So, um, William, it's not funny, William. Anthony. Um, anyhow, thank you, Deborah. Thank you, Susan. Uh, I will hope to see you all again soon. And uh, everybody out there, take care. Thank you so much. Enjoy, and we will see each other on Wednesday. All right? Enjoy yourselves. Okay? Bye-bye.